listening to Conferences Online Allergy from Children's Mercy Hospital in Kansas City, Missouri. Today is August 21st, 2023. Our topic is non-IgE mediated food allergies. Our presenter is Dr. David Stukas. He is the director of the Food Allergy Treatment Center in the Division of Allergy and Immunology and a professor of clinical pediatrics at Nationwide Children's Hospital in Columbus, Ohio. Welcome everybody to our second discussion today on conferences online and allergy on August 21st. Our second presentation today will, oh my goodness, I just lost, excuse me. <laughs> Sorry, I just lost part of my screen here. I'll be back with you in just a quick moment. Three and a half years into Zoom and we still have all these difficulties, isn't it? Yeah, yeah, and this one's on me here. Somehow uh, one of my uh, documents disappeared <laughs> and that would happen to be your introduction after you oh, provided that with us. Here's me. That's all you need to do. Okay, okay. so I, with this, sorry about that, guys. Um, we've got Dr. David Stukas, who's uh, director of the Food Allergy and Treatment Center. Uh, he's in the Division of Allergy and Immunology at Nationwide Children's Hospital. He's gonna, here to, today to speak to us on non-IGE mediated food allergies. Thank you, Dr. Stukas. It's my pleasure. Thank you so much for, for having me back. Um, I always enjoy um, giving this presentation and try my best to updated accordingly um, every year, every couple of years. And I think this would be a nice um, piggyback on what Matt Rank talked about a little while ago. I will talk about EOE a little bit. I'm not going to bore you with all the details um, because you just got that conversation. So why don't we jump right into it? Uh, here are my disclosures, which aren't relevant to what we'll talk about today. And really what I want to focus on is trying to uh, tease out differences between the various non-IgE mediated food allergies because there can be some overlap. Uh, really, you know, spend time thinking through the proper diagnosis, which is going to focus on the clinical history for the most part, and then really talk about management and the role of shared decision making. So why are we talking about this? Well, as all of you know, this is often a common concern, whether it's a parent of a child that they come to us or whether it's, it's an adult patient. Uh, there's a lot of people out there that, you know, generally don't feel well for various reasons, and oftentimes they will attribute it to the food that they're eating. Uh, and if they spend more than 30 seconds online, they will come across whether it's influencers on social media or in it, internet searches that are, are yelling at them that there are hidden causes of all that ails humanity based upon what's, what's in their diet. Uh, so they're going to come to us with these preconceived notions and, and thinking like it must be something I'm eating, um, you know, which can be really hard to tease out. So a couple of thoughts for all of us, it's really focusing on a detailed history. And if they can't tell us when I eat this food, I feel this way. We should start thinking away from maybe, you know, foods causing an allergic type of response or even an intolerance. It certainly could be there and there could be some, you know, um, quote unquote hidden causes. But if they can't figure it out, it's unlikely we're going to figure it out. And we can use our understanding of the prevalence of these different conditions, the differential diagnosis and really, you know, good communication to better understand could be causes for what's going on here. And for me personally, I, I think it's best sometimes to say, you know, I'm really not sure. Uh, I know you think it may be X, Y, or Z. I'm worried about these other things. We can take these different approaches. If you want to try an elimination diet, don't take it out of your out of your diet for the next six months. Let's try it for two weeks and then put it back in and keep a careful diary and we can work with our patients. And I think sometimes it's fine just to say, I'm not really sure what's going on here. And then the other thing we can really help patients and, and parents of children understand is that the human mind is engineered to find causation everywhere. We, we ask a lot of questions. We like to have easy answers. It makes us feel good about being, uh, you know, part of a, the homo sapien species. Um, but not always are, is, you know, you know it, it's oftentimes correlation and not causation. So just because you're eating something and having symptoms, it doesn't mean that one caused the other. All right. One thing that I love doing, so I walk into you know new new consultation rooms. I generally uh, try to make everybody feel at ease by saying, "I'm so glad you're here today because we really love helping people clarify what's the actual diagnosis because misdiagnosis can lead to unnecessary elimination." And what I will do is oftentimes I'll walk into a room. I know they don't have food allergy or intolerance. Just walking in for the reason for referral and the history that's provided so far. So sometimes what I'll do is I'll just define what these are right at the outset. 
and I'll walk through a food allergy will cause rapid onset reproducible symptoms every single time you eat the food. The best test is what happens when I eat the food. If you're eating without these symptoms, we know you're not allergic to it. Intolerances are more delayed and, and due to digestion, I, I address food sensitivities and I talk about testing and things like that. More often than not, um, after I give that little spiel, the parent or the patient will say, oh, why well, I, I clearly don't have food allergies. And I say, okay, I agree with you. And let's talk about why unnecessary testing isn't gonna be very helpful and maybe thinking through other causes of what, what's causing your symptoms. So that, that's that been an approach that's been very helpful for me. And I'm sure all of you to, you know, take similar tactics when you're trying to explain things to patients as well. All right, I'm not gonna bury the references on every slide or at the end. These are the references. You have my slides. You can take screenshots on your, whatever device you're on, but these are really, um, three very good references that go through a lot of this information, uh, and I'll, I'll um, you know, go back to them repeatedly throughout. One thing I've noticed, I, I believe I've given a version of this talk for the last five years or so, uh, maybe a little bit longer, but every time I do it and as I go to update it, I'm noticing within our literature that there is this nice paradigm shift that's really just starting to address why do we do the things that we do? And we're all familiar with the Choosing Wisely series and then the offshoot of that, the Things That Don't Matter series. Um, and a lot of times we just get caught in this, this habit of, well, let's make this diagnosis, let's take food out of the diet. And I think there's a real recognition now that dietary elimination is not a benign thing. Uh, we'll talk about atopic derm um, for just a little bit as well. Um, but, you know, we have new evidence and guidelines that we can all fall back on now and say, look, it's not just me saying this. This isn't my opinion. Here's the evidence. And you can share that with um, you know, folks in um, uh, a GI or a primary care that are referring patients to you or with patients themselves. And I think ultimately this is leading us to really, um, you know, achieve progress in many good ways, but it's up to all of us to become comfortable with this ourselves and then, you know, understand how to put this into clinical practice. And this leads back to something I presented a couple of times here is this was published in JAMA Pediatrics about three years ago, which is great. This was a deep dive into nine international um, cow's milk allergy guidelines. And they found that uh, for the vast majority of them, they weren't evidence-based and they were putting every symptom imaginable to like fussiness and intermittent rash and colic and stuff like that saying this must be due to, to cow's milk allergy. Uh, and then uh, it goes through this document. I encourage you to read it and, you know, walking through like maternal breast milk rarely if ever contains intact you know, protein of the food that that person ingested. And then uh, to throw in the conspiracy aspect, three of the guidelines were supported by formula manufacturers. So there's a lot that goes on behind all of this. And no way, in no way do I want to suggest that all of our guidelines are, uh, you know, um, there's conspiracy lying behind them. But I think it does behoove all of us to really take a look and say, why do we do the things that we do once the actual evidence show? And this was another recent review from a few years ago. I love this article. And basically what this goes through is it walks through of, we should not be making blanket recommendations to breastfeeding mothers to start taking food out of their diet because the vast majority of them um, don't have to. Uh, and just to you look at the conclusions, a thoughtful approach is necessary and we wanna minimize unnecessary elimination diets. Here's the algorithm. So you're not gonna be able to see this. And I put this on here on purpose because if you're gonna tell a mother to take food out of her diet, you better have a good reason to do so. And the reason starts with what's the diagnosis for the child? Uh, what, what are the odds that whatever she's eating is actually being passed through the breast milk into the child's diet that's causing their symptoms because there's a lot of harm that can come from this. Not to mention that it will delay the actual diagnosis. And also with infants, a lot of times, whatever they're experiencing is just a normal part of development and it's transient. So if we undergo these massive elimination diets for mom or for baby, a lot of times whatever's going on inside their gut is just gonna mature and resolve on its own, regardless of what we do from a dietary standpoint. And then hot off the press, I don't know if you saw this, this was just published a month ago. Uh, this is from the World Allergy Organization. So we're gonna, we're gonna talk about this a little bit. These are the DRACMA guidelines that really walk through uh, cow's milk allergy and, and reevaluating the evidence behind diagnosis and dietary elimination. And there's a couple main themes. So the first theme would be cow's milk allergy, quote unquote allergy is both over and under diagnosed. So really being thoughtful about why are we diagnosing this and is this likely the cause of their symptoms? The elimination diet has sort of been revisited in these guidelines, but there's both the diagnostic elimination uh, trial period and then a therapeutic elimination trial period as well. And then reintroduction. Uh, there's concepts surrounding the milk ladder. And then, you know, this outdated approach of, oh, you must have cow's milk allergy. You need to avoid it until you're 12 months of age, like something happens in the gut when the day you turn one. Well, there's no evidence to support that. And oftentimes we can actually get milk back in the diet in some form much, much sooner than waiting until they turn one year of age. 
If you're not familiar, our, our friends and colleagues in Canada have been using uh, milk and egg ladders for a couple of years. There's a great website. This is an open access publication, great colorful infographics. And what they do, and you can either uh, use the citation I put on the slide or you can just search CSACI milk ladder. Um, but it's a great way of thinking through, okay, for those who can tolerate baked milk, do we really need to have strict, strict, strict avoidance? And I think as a whole with food allergy, we, we really need to rethink just because you have a diagnosis of the word food allergy, whether it's IgE mediated or non-IgE mediated, does that necessarily equate with complete and strict avoidance? Well, we know from IgE food allergies, no. We know that the threshold dose that's necessary to cause a reaction for the you know, half of people with milk allergy is almost a teaspoon of milk or a little bit more, uh, let alone anaphylaxis. So everybody has different thresholds. And when it comes to non-IgE food allergy, I think we need to start asking these questions as well because strict elimination can be really difficult to do, especially with things like precautionary labels and trace amounts and cross contact and calling manufacturers every time you get the product from the store. Um, I think that we've, you know, we need to sort of course correct a little bit uh, and go back from you know those blanket recommendations for folks. But this is a great reference and I encourage all of you to check it out. All right, when it comes to non-IgE food allergies, we have uh, basically the gut, which we'll spend most of our time on, the skin, and then a really cool sort of uh, respiratory issue that we'll talk about at the end. I'm not gonna cover celiac disease. Um, I think you can argue that that's not a true food allergy. As we all know, it's an immune response uh, to the presence of gluten in the diet, um, but that's not gonna be sort of covered under today's talk. We'll talk about uh, skin for just a little bit, and then I'll finish with this uh, interesting story about Heiner syndrome. Okay, so when it comes to the pathophysiology, we still don't have a great idea of exactly what's going on for all of these conditions and in every individual. It's likely some combination of, um, you know, uh, T cell mediated response to foods in the diet. Uh, we know that it's not acute presentation for the most part, except for FPIs, uh, but more of these can be more chronic with just ongoing exposure. And then there's new theories because there's a lot of folks from looking at things from a GI lens versus an allergy lens, and they're seeing a lot of overlap, whether it's autoinflammatory conditions, eosinophilic disease, uh, the microbiome has gained so much attention in the last four to five years that there's probably something there that will be teased out in the future. But I don't think that there's good evidence that clearly states that, you know, this is the cause of that or whatever. But I think moving forward, we're probably going to rethink our understanding of some of these non-IgE mediated food allergies in the context of the of the whole person and, and including the microbiome as well. And maybe they're not truly allergic to that food, but because of the presence of whatever conditions causing inflammation in their gut, ingestion of that food worsens that condition, so on and so forth. But uh, just stay tuned. I think that's going to change dramatically in the next five to 10 years. All right. Uh, I like to be as consistent as possible. And I think when it comes to non-IgE food allergies, consistency is the key, both starting with the clinical presentation, thinking through the common foods that are causes of these different conditions with whether or not testing is indicated or helpful, management, and then prognosis. So that's sort of the approach that we'll take as we go through these individually. And we're going to start with FPIs. I'm sure you're well familiar with the, the most recent iteration of the international consensus guidelines. One thing I will state is that with FPIs, the evidence is evolving, and I think a lot of uh, our prior knowledge was based upon just a couple of major academic centers that sort of drove our understanding of FPIs. And I think we need to take a step back and say, is this really the entire population of people who have FPIs, or is this really the experience of those who, who are sort of first to do the research and first to put the word out there? Uh, and I'll give you some updated information as we go through this. So as we're all familiar, FPIs typically presents early in life, often, um, you know, almost always before a year of age. Uh, and it occurs with you know, either formula introduction or the introduction of solid foods. The acute presentation is most common. And the story is typically they ate something, they were completely fine. One to three hours later, exorcist type vomiting, where it was profuse vomiting, sometimes followed by diarrhea and then a period of lethargy as well. Some of these infants can look very ill. I think now we're understanding that those scary stories we've heard of kids going into hypovolemic shock and things like that, that is not, that's the minority of children who experience FPIs. Typically they just have some profuse vomiting uh, and then a period of time where they sort of readjust and they it's self-resolved. There is a chronic FPIs that's been described as well, which is, which is really difficult to diagnose because the symptoms overlap with so many other conditions that we can see. Uh, but this is gonna be more intermittent, uh, but worsening vomiting or diarrhea, sometimes failure to thrive as that infant continues to ingest that food. Adult onset FPIs has been described recently. This is from a year ago. Uh, there's a small case series. Uh, so we really have no idea the prevalence and, and what's going on here. Uh, there were some key differences noted in adults who had suspected FPIs compared to uh, the pediatric population. Uh, there was more female predominant. 
And then they yeah, said so 25% like vomiting, which to me, I always question, well, how are you diagnosing with FPIs when essentially you need to have vomiting to establish the diagnosis, as we'll talk about. But this is what they described in their series. And then they found it mostly with seafood, actually, as the majority of causative foods. So I think it's important to keep our eye out and better understand this. But I always like to say other alternate explanations as well. In regards to clues, um, it's really hard to diagnose FPIs after one episode of profuse vomiting just because the differential diagnosis is so large. I've done this in my career a couple of times just because it was so classic in regards to the presentation. And we talked about avoidance of that food for a period of time before introducing it again. We want to rule out infectious causes, comorbid conditions. If they're vomiting all the time, or if they come with a list of 12 suspected foods, it's unlikely to be FPIs, uh, but they need to have that kind of classic story. Also, if, they, if they're truly sick, so infants with FPIs are generally well, they're fine, except for that acute episode when they have vomiting. So if the patient you're evaluating really has failure to thrive or uh, they have other comorbid conditions where they're not doing well, uh, it's probably not FPIs. There are diagnostic criteria that have been established. Uh, there's both major and minor criteria. And as you see, the major criteria, you need to have vomiting, and that's what FPIs is. And then minor criteria can include a second episode of vomiting, uh, repetitive vomiting after different foods. And then you have the, the extreme presentation that was initially described in some of those centers that I mentioned before with extreme lethargy and they have power, they need IV fluids for rehydration and things like that. So if they present uh, with the major and multiple of these minor criteria, that's probably FPOS. As far as the foods and causes, uh, we know that milk and soy are the more common causes in young infants who are formula fed, but as they start eating solids, it's a little different than IgE mediated food allergies. So we're seeing things like oat and rice, uh, also egg and then fruits and vegetables can absolutely cause this as you all know. Um, the vast majority of, of infants only have FPIs to one food um, and less than 10% react to more than three foods. So I don't think it needs to be as scary and daunting about introducing new foods to that infant as FPIs as we once thought it was. And if they're truly exclusively breastfed, we really need to rethink this diagnosis. Now, it's interesting as we focused on food allergy prevention with advice to introduce allergenic foods into the diet early and keeping the diet consistently, we're seeing different foods uh, present as a cause of FPIs that we didn't necessarily see before. And peanut, I'm sure all of you have seen this. I've seen this myself. Um, so, you know, uh, we want to make sure we're not missing an IgE, an unusual presentation of IgE food allergy to peanut especially, but it certainly can be a cause. And there was a case series published out of Mount Sinai. This was just published uh, two months ago um, in uh, Jackie in Practice, and this is from the University of Michigan. They had 350 or so um, children with FPIs, and what they found was that oat was the most common trigger, but if you look at this, if you can see it, you're seeing banana and potato and avocado and peanut kind of creep up there as you know more common causes of FPIs in this cohort that they have. So I de I've definitely seen banana and avocado in my practice as well. Uh, so I think, again, as I mentioned before, we need to rethink that traditional thought process as far as what FPIs is and what causes it. Interestingly, they found that the majority, um, slight majority, I should say, only had one trigger, but 75% had two triggers or less. Um, so, you know, I think that goes back to what I mentioned before. I don't think we need to kind of scare parents into thinking that their child's going to have FPIs to six different foods. Can it occur? Absolutely. Is it likely to occur? Not nearly as likely as just one or two foods. So what's the testing? Well, in general, for all of these conditions we're gonna talk about today, the history is, is always the best test. So we wanna really go through about a careful detailed history in regards to ingestion of the food and the symptoms and the timing of onset, the description and things like that. And then we can always rely on the trial elimination diets. Um, I emphasize and reintroduction. The way I typically recommend it is if you're worried about these specific foods or we think that this is the cause, let's take these specific foods completely out of the diet for a period of two to three weeks. I want a detailed uh, symptom diary every day, objectively measuring whatever symptoms you thought were being caused by that food. At the, at the end of that two to three weeks, if those symptoms have not resolved, it wasn't that food. We can put that food back in the diet. If those symptoms have resolved completely, we need to put that food back in the diet. And then we need to see if those symptoms come back again, because a lot of times they actually don't. Uh, so whatever was going on there, it just wasn't due to a true allergic mechanism. What is not indicated are patch tests uh, for the vast majority of these or serum IgG, IgG4. I know we're seeing more in the literature, especially with eosinophilic esophagitis, but I don't think that it's been well established that this is useful as a guide for which food should be taken out of the diet. There have been some um, meta-analyses I found in regards to A to B patch tests, and it's interesting what they look at. I think one of them found it may be beneficial for uh, people with like delayed gastric emptying, which is not even a, a food allergy. Um, I think what's going to happen is if you take enough people um, 
with various symptoms and you put enough patch tests on their back, you're going to find a hit somewhere, but it goes back to, is it causation or correlation? So again, it's not advised to do a bunch of patch testing for people for the diagnosis of non-IgE food allergy. So for FPIs, what's missing is important. These infants really should not have associated urticaria, angioedema, anaphylaxis. Uh, IgE, te IgE tests should be negative, but keep in mind, if you do IgE tests on every child that you see, you know, up to 30% are going to have a positive result. So eventually you're going to find those that, you know, are sensitized, but maybe that's not, it's a different mechanism than FPIs. That could be important when you go to reintroduce that. And then there's very nonspecific abnormalities if you happen to have a blood sample while they're acutely uh, reacting to their suspected food. As far as management, really, we talk about elimination diet. That should completely resolve their symptoms. Uh, we'll talk about some of the nuances of that in a second. And then uh, we, we do like to give uh, folks a letter in case they have to go to the emergency department. Uh, and there's great examples of that uh, from the FPIES Foundation. You may have this in your own EHR like we do. And then please prescribe Odansetron to everybody. Uh, I think every parent on the planet should have Odansetron available for our children because they vomit from time to time. Here's an example of the letter. It basically says, my child has an interesting condition called FPIES. If they present to your emergency department um, because they're very ill, please evaluate them because they may have sepsis or something else. But if we think it's an FPIES reaction, don't waste your time with epinephrine and with uh, antihistamines and corticosteroids. Give them supportive care and please give them Zofran. Now, as far as feeding recommendations, this goes back again to some of the older and guidance from these these major academic centers that sort of was the first to get out there and there's you know conservative ways of introducing this and I, I present this not because I want you to memorize it but if you're looking for specific guidance you can find it some people really like to have black and white information about if I have FPIs to this what food should I introduce uh, other people will take more of a gestalt and you know in, the, in this age of shared decision making I think it's really worthwhile to talk to families like listen it's very unlikely your child is going to have FPIs to, you know, any more than two foods. Uh, I highly recommend you introduce all these foods in their diet uh, and keep them in their diet consistently. You now have Zofran on board. So if they do have another reaction to another food, it's going to make it much less severe um, and give them that confidence. This is just another example of, you know, uh, different ages and different types of foods causing FPIs and how to guide introduction. I encourage you, again, only if you truly think in a black and white fashion of you need this to kind of walk you through, but be familiar with it. And, and just look at, you know, some of this guidance that's been published at least. All right, so questions we don't really know the answer to. Um, do we need to avoid precautionary labeling if you have somebody with FPIs? I would argue no. Uh, I would argue that you probably need to ingest that intact food protein in a reasonable amount, way more than trace amounts or cross contact to provoke a reaction. Um, what about baked egg and baked milk? I mean, it makes sense for those with IgE allergies that a significant portion can tolerate it when you heat it in the oven because it changes the the epitopes and the conformation of the proteins. So we would think that would apply to FPIs. We just don't know. Nobody's done that study that I'm aware of. What about similar foods? So you can, you know, talk yourself in circles with cross reactivity until the cows come home, but I don't think we need to do that when it comes to FPIs especially. What about IV access before a challenge? I will argue based upon our own experience at our center that this is a huge waste of time. I know there's a lot of scary stories out there, but we also need to look at the the denominator of how many children don't have that. We know that FPIs tends to get better as kids get older, even if it hasn't resolved. Also, we have Zofran available. Um, my colleague, Dr. McHale, gives IM Zofran. I typically use oral Zofran, but um, it works pretty well. So what about prognosis? The vast majority of children will uh, be able to tolerate that food as they get older. We just don't know when. Uh, we generally recommend wait a year or so and since, since their last known reaction before we introduce it again. Uh, there is some guidance out there to consider IgE testing before you reintroduce it just to make sure things haven't switched over, that they haven't become sensitized for some reason, which could absolutely change the type of reaction they would experience. And then there's been criteria they've been established for positive challenge. I don't recommend you get stool samples and blood samples and things like that. If you have somebody with suspected FPIs, you feed them the food that they were avoiding uh, and then they vomit three hours later, that was FPIs. So I don't think we need to you know, confirm that necessarily. So how to challenge. This is where we're seeing this paradigm shift. Um, so at our center, we have a shared decision making conversation and we say, listen, you're, it's been 12 months. Your child's you know, symptoms were self-resolved. I would say for anybody who didn't require emergency room care for their initial reaction or reactions, it's unlikely they're going to require emergency room care for their subsequent reactions. Again, we have Zofran on board. Um, what we do oftentimes is we actually have the family feed the food at home and then drive in. Why? Because reactions don't occur immediately. Um, two, um, infants are much more likely to eat uh, when they're in the home environment. And three, we can, we can save hours uh, you know, off their, off their visit sometimes by having them do that. Uh, because FPI's reactions, you know, they need to stick around a little bit longer. 
there are more conservative ways. So if you're not as comfortable with this, or if you have somebody who has a high risk history where they really did have uh, shock after uh, eating their food, we're going to be much more careful. Uh, I still would argue that we don't need to have IVs in place necessarily, but it all depends on your location and um, and where you are in, in regards to access to a p pediatric emergency department, what you have in your office in regards to resuscitation and things like that. But I'll go back to that argument of we all have Zofran available uh, and we can use that. And it's generally going to make kids feel a lot better. And this also tends to improve as kids get older. So these are things that we can weigh. Uh, I know this is somewhat controversial, but I think that we need to you know, kind of lean on our own experience at some point as well and um, and move forward in regards to this. Okay, so we're going to move on from FPIs to food protein induced allergic proctocolitis. This is the traditional quote unquote cow's milk allergy. We're all very familiar. This is a otherwise very healthy baby. Parents go and change their diaper one day and they see blood in their stool. They're otherwise eating well, acting well, rarely if ever have failure to thrive, but they may have some, some colic and gassiness, but most infants do at some point as well. Uh, I apologize if you're eating your lunch right now, uh, but this is typically you know, a good example of what this would look like. Um, they'll be hemocol positive or gross red blood, obviously. And then for most infants, this is going to be cow's milk or possibly soy. This can occur in breastfed infants, although from my personal opinion, I think we need to rethink that because uh, as I mentioned before, very little intact food protein gets passed through the breast milk. So I think we need to really think about pathophysiology. And if we're overdiagnosing cow's milk allergy in a lot of these infants, you know, is it really being passed through the breast milk? So that's just my own sort of personal aside, but it's been described that way. IgE testing should be negative. There's really no indication to do that testing. Uh, and you're, you're not going to really find any diagnostic tests or specific abnormalities that will that will manage this. So elimination diet can take time. If we suspect that this is what's going on here, we should remove that food from the infant's diet. Uh, I recommend not playing formula roulette. And I, I think counseling families, oftentimes we're not the first ones seeing them. It's often uh, primary care pediatricians. So when I educate them, I say, listen, don't tell them not to expect complete resolution with the next diaper change. That's unrealistic. They will come back to your office. They will call you. Give them three days uh, because that's what it, it may take for some of these kids because they have you know, injury um, uh, to their gut. So it, it takes time for that to heal uh, when they're avoiding that specific food trigger. And we don't want to go straight to hypoallergenic formulas. The vast majority of infants with cow's milk uh, food protein induced pro allergic proctocolitis can tolerate soy formula. So it's worthwhile to go through that. And the reason why is because this is relatively a benign condition. We're not going to miss anything if we wait three to four days and try a soy based formula. That's what the parents are willing to go with. Uh, and if they still continue to have symptoms, then we can switch after that. So there's no sense of urgency necessarily. As far as prognosis, the vast majority of these infants improve, and it doesn't have to wait until 12 months of age. Most of them are better within a couple of months. Uh, so I think all of us have been taught just wait until you're a year. It probably is just easier to remember that. But if we want to be thoughtful about this, and I'll show you the DRACA guidelines in a second, I think we can try introducing again after just a couple of weeks. Um, and then this really just is self-resolved for the most part. So here's those new guidelines I mentioned before, and this walks through both the if you have suspected cow's milk allergy, uh, the diagnostic and therapeutic elimination. So basically the diagnostic elimination is, well, let's take it out for two to four weeks. Do your symptoms completely improve? Yes. Reintroduce it. Do the symptoms come back again? Okay. Now we go to the therapeutic elimination where we take it out for six to 12 months potentially. But um, the reason that there's this provision to reintroduce it after just two to four weeks, one, that may not be the proper diagnosis in the first place, or two, even if it was, this may be self-resolved and they actually don't need to avoid cow's milk um, protein for six to 12 months, which can have other um, unintended consequences as well. So I think this is a really nice, very straightforward way to think through this. I encourage all of you to read through this on your own, uh, have a journal club on it, that sort of thing. All right, so moving on to fruit, food protein enteropathy. So this is much more severe. Uh, I have not seen this to my knowledge in my career, uh, but it's certainly out there and we're probably going to meet uh, these patients in the hospital setting because they've been admitted for failure to thrive or for very severe chronic gastrointestinal symptoms. Uh, almost always presents before 9 to 12 months of age, uh, severe, severe diarrhea, uh, and then they can get very sick just from protein loss, like, you know, abdominal distension, malabsorption. Most common food, cow's milk, uh, it's been associated with this, but others have been described as having soy, wheat, egg, or multiple food allergies, and we shouldn't be seeing this in infants who are exclusively breastfed. As far as testing, again, IgE tests should be negative. Uh, biopsy can show um, some uh, nonspecific changes such as villous atrophy, um, and you can have nonspecific abnormalities as, as I mentioned before. So the diagnosis really is of exclusion and with um, you know having kind of your, your magnifying glass out looking for the, the rare of the rare. 
Uh, elimination diet, diet should resolve, but this isn't going to happen overnight. So think about the damage that goes on with food protein induced allergic proctocolitis, which is very mild. That can take three to four days to resolve. This is more severe damage that can take weeks to resolve. Uh, and they require a lot of the nutritional monitoring and support. As far as prognosis, most of this is self-resolved and they just magically get better as they get older. Uh, and you can try again uh, at some period of time in the future. And this is just a nice little uh, infographic that I, I found in this uh, review article from 2020 that walks through what part of the lower gastrointestinal tract is involved in these different conditions. So we have the, uh, the large intestines involved in uh, food protein induced allergic proctocolitis. It's more the small intestines with food protein induced enteropathy. F5 is, who knows, is throughout the GI tract. And then it also gives you in regards to frequency and severity as well. The differential diagnosis, as you know, is pretty long, so we need to consider you know, multiple other potential causes of these symptoms and be really careful as, our, um, as clinicians before we just say this is clearly FPIs or food protein induced enteropathy or anything like that. So this is oftentimes where we get our, our wonderful GI specialist involved as well. Uh, and then it's also, you know, the gut can be involved in a lot of underlying autoimmune conditions, primary immune deficiencies and things like that. So just kind of working through the differential for every patient that you see. Now, when it comes to eosinophilic gastrointestinal disease, as I mentioned, Dr. Rank spent a lot of time talking about this, so I'm not going to go through details, but I just would like to share a couple of thoughts that I assume will reinforce what Dr. Rank shared um, because we're very like-minded and we were co-authors on, on the last guidelines. So e, uh, EOE is the most common form, but there are other forms of EJ as well, as you know, and this is likely some combination of, of T-cell mediated, um, you know, uh, inflammation and uh, response to allergen when it's in the diet. And there is more of a male predominance uh, especially uh, younger uh, younger children. Now, as far as the presentation, as you know, in children, it can be variable, mostly with abdominal pain, vomiting, uh, nausea, can have failure to thrive. In adults, that's when you start worrying more about solid food dysphagia or more pain with swallowing and things like that. Most common foods, milk is going to be the most common food uh, by far. Up to 50% have had milk implicated as, as the trigger for their underlying inflammation. That's uh, also been associated with wheat and egg and, and other allergenic foods as well. Uh, from the international guidelines, I just want to emphasize that we now understand different phenotypes of EOE, so every patient is going to be different. Uh, we do need to establish that they have eosinophilia present uh, in their esophagus, so a biopsy is still necessary to establish the diagnosis. Thankfully, we're seeing less invasive ways to do those biopsies now, um, and we want to make sure we're ruling out other non, you know, other causes of eosinophils in the esophagus. And if anything extends beyond the esophagus, you absolutely have to second guess that diagnosis. So you can have eosinophils in the esophagus as part of EGID, that doesn't necessarily mean you have EOE. You're all familiar with the endoscopic findings. It can be completely normal, uh, which is why you still need to have the biopsies or you can see severe changes after long standing damage has occurred, such as those esophageal rings and furrows and exudates and things like that. For biopsies, I think everybody's well familiar now, and especially our, our GI colleagues who are doing these biopsies, we need to go uh, from multiple different areas, uh, ideally uh, from proximal distal and, and, and the middle part of the esophagus, uh, multiple different biopsies to make sure that we're not missing patchy eosinophilia that can be present. And then this is just a list of different causes of eosinophilia. I think I've shared this before. Um, I worked at Children's Hospital of Pittsburgh. That was my first faculty position, oh my gosh, 15 years ago. Uh, and the ENT group there, when they were taking tonsils out during their surgery, they were getting biopsies of the esophagus. And then when they were finding, you know, 15 EOs per high powered field, they were diagnosing them with the EOE or they were sending them us. Why, why they were doing this, we don't know, but we put a stop to this and we found out. And it turns out a lot of these kids just had allergic rhinitis. Uh, and then, you know, they were, you know, kind of swallowing the eosinophils that were present in their nares. So there's lots of reasons why you can have eosinophils there and not have EOE. Management, just to piggyback on what Dr. Rank kind of conveyed, um, you know, it's shared decision making. There are so many different ways to manage EOE, and it really does come down to patient preferences and values. We have dietary elimination, proton pump inhibitors, corticosteroids, and now we have biologics that have to be considered as well. In regards to the approach to dietary therapy, Matt went through all the different recommendations, which I'm not going to do, but I will just say I think we're, we have to move past the point of doing skin testing to 80 different foods when somebody has EOE. Um, you know, specific IgE tests really aren't a very good guide as to what may be triggering their symptoms. This is probably just showing non-specific sensitization in, in otherwise highly allergic individuals. Uh, a lot of these folks have significant ATP in general, so we're going to get a lot of false positives. Uh, and then really walking through the options because every patient's going to have different preference in regards to how they go about treating their disease. There's different elimination diets, of course. So we have the elemental diet. Almost everybody gets better, but why don't we do that? Because it's intolerable. People hate it. 
uh, people like to eat. And that's a, that's a terrible way to go through life if you're not able to enjoy food and, and put an NG tube down and give them, you know, hypoallergenic formula as opposed to actually letting them eat. There's six food elimination. And these were all made up, by the way, um, you know, years ago as, as an approach to try to help these, these individuals. So um, there's some evidence to support them. And as you see, the, those are the ones that get better. Uh, but a lot of folks get better if you just take dairy out of their diet as well. So that's a reasonable approach to take of just like, let's try milk elimination. And then if you know better, then we go for other foods. Prognosis is variable. A lot of children will have an improvement in their disease over time. Sometimes it's more of a waxing, waning uh, sort of condition. And then of course, we worry about those who have true chronic disease that can lead to strictures um, and remodeling and things like that. Uh, these are the, the guidelines that Matt went through with you. Uh, the only thing I'm going to focus on here, what he already did too, is really thinking through the recommendations. So there's strong and conditional recommendations, which are based upon the strength of the evidence. I just love highlighting this because it's both for the patient and the clinician. So a strong recommendation, um, only a small proportion of patients wouldn't want that. And then for the clinician, most individuals should receive the recommended course. But for conditional recommendations, it's kind of a, a coin flip. Some will want it, some won't want it. Uh, and there's different choices. So most of the recommendations are conditional. So I think with EOE, this is like the prime disease that we deal with that really um, should be dealt with shared decision making. There is no one size fits all approach when it comes to this. And there's no right or wrong answer either. As far as strategies, you know, really walking through the, the main different ways of approaching this, talking about specific choices, risks, benefits, expected outcomes, and then reassess over time because other options may be necessary. I don't know if you've seen this. I don't know if Matt actually presented this, um, but this was a yardstick that was just published in Annals this summer, which is fantastic. And if you look at the title, Clinical Guidance for the Use of Dupilumab in, e in EOE, uh, this really walks through now that we have biologics available to treat this condition, how do we incorporate that into shared decision-making, into our medical decision-making for each patient? And what it really boils down to is there's a role for it as first-line therapy or a role for it as more step-up therapy and things to consider. So for first-line, it would be uh, patient preference. Do they want to avoid any uh, dietary elimination or the use of uh, swallowed corticosteroids? Or do they have other comorbid conditions that may fit from treatment with um, Because if that's the case, then they more lean towards that and say, hey, uh, not only do you have EOE, but you also have pretty severe atopic dermatitis. Uh, you also have, you know, persistent asthma. I think we can make you feel better for multiple, you know, conditions with this one treatment. And then in consideration for more step-up therapy, do they have refractory disease? Have they sort of earned that right to, to try the biologic because they've tried dietary elimination, they've tried corticosteroids without getting better? Do they have severe dietary restrictions and life just isn't worth living because they can't eat anything? Uh, or do they have other, you know, severe adverse effects from uh, either the treatment that they pursued before or longstanding disease such as strictures? All right, so we're going to move on from the gut, and as we kind of wrap things up here, we'll talk about the skin. So with contact dermatitis, we're, there's different forms of this. So there's allergic contact dermatitis, there's irritant contact dermatitis, uh, and then there's systemic, uh, which is more board fodder. Uh, but some of our colleagues, you know, if, if, if everything that you see looks the same, you start thinking that this is everywhere. So I want you to be aware of it. Uh, so the clinical presentation is direct contact with the skin. It can cause that local inflammatory response. Or if it's more systemic, it's ongoing ingestion can cause flares at other sites of uh, previous that were previously affected by atopic dermatitis or more widespread disease as well. Other things to think about, I diagnose irritant contact dermatitis at least three times a day. The typical story is you have an infant or toddler who's feeding themselves. They often have blonde hair, blue eyes, very, very sensitive skin. Food touches their skin and causes a localized rash, but they're otherwise happy. And we can see this from 200 different foods. And I always tell this to families, I say, this is very common with berries, tomato-based foods, any sauces, any citrus, cinnamon is a common cause, bananas, uh, and so on and so forth. So it goes down to the demeanor of the child. If they look happy, but their face is you know, red, wherever food touched it, they're fine. That's not a food allergy reaction. That's more irritation of their skin. And we want to keep that food in the diet. And that's going to get better as they get older. And then um, contact urticaria is interesting. We've had several patients lately. Just last week, I was doing an oral food challenge for peanut, and they had contact urticaria everywhere the peanut touched them, and they were messy when they were eating. They were 22 months old. But then we kept going in regards to ingestion, and they ate six grams of protein, and it didn't progress, and everything resolved on its own. Uh, so, But we had that conversation with the family, and we, and we helped guide them. Like, look, if it touches their skin, they're going to get a high, but they can eat it all day, and it's going to be in their best interest to keep it in their diet. That can be really tricky to tease out. Uh, but that certainly exists as well. All right, so these are some examples of um, some of the food um, allergic contact dermatitis, um, and this is from mango, and you're going to see this more often than not in um, 
food workers, if they're using the hands a lot, you can see it with wheat um, and it's been described with, you know, various foods. So if they're touching things with their, if there's um, bare skin on a regular basis and having rashes in those area, in those areas, we want to uh, put this diagnosis into consideration. This is where past testing can be very helpful. Uh, so just like other causes of contact dermatitis, uh, past testing to foods can be very helpful to establish exactly what the cause is for these patients. And then management is avoid as much as you can. Uh, if we think that they have systemic reactions, we want to avoid for a couple of months and then consider reintroduction to see if symptoms recur again. So try to get their skin as clear as possible before we're eating it again. And just to you know have this on here because it is a little bit for board fodder. So balsam of Peru and nickel are probably the most common ones associated with systemic contact dermatitis. And this can change based upon the quantity that they eat. Nickel is kind of everywhere. Um, it's found in our soil. So it's been associated with um, you know vegetables uh, and fruits that are grown out of the ground. Of course, anything that comes in a can uh, can be exposed to it as well. And that can be more tricky to manage. All right, now when it comes to atopic dermatitis and food allergies, I'm not going to spend a lot of time on this, but what I want to do is I want to set the stage because you're going to hear a lot more about this over the next six to 12 months, and I'll show you why. So uh, we now have guidelines that are forthcoming that specifically state do not perform dietary elimination or food specific IgE testing in the management of atopic dermatitis unless they truly have refractory disease despite good daily skin care high potency topical corticosteroids, avoidance of all the non-food triggers that are out there, and then we assess their adherence. Um, so it's kind of like with asthma step-up therapy, always assess adherence, right? And we know it's really hard to put these emollients on the skin on a regular basis and avoid all those triggers, but we want to get away from suggesting to families that food is the cause of their child's atopic dermatitis. We want to get away from doing unnecessary testing because it's causing harm. There was a great systematic review that was published last year that really walked through all of this. I'm going to cut to the chase. In their conclusions, it basically said um, elimination diet may lead to a slight improvement in severity in some patients. However, the degree of benefit is potentially unimportant compared with the risk for harm, including developing IgE allergies. So it is now well established. If you take somebody with hepatitis who has already a high level of nonspecific sensitization, you get false positive testing. If they're eating a food and not experiencing immediate onset, hives, swelling, anaphylaxis, they don't have IgE reactions, but they have detectable IgE and you tell that person to take that food out of their diet for a period of time, then they go to eat that food again, up to 15 to 20% of them will then develop IgE food allergy. So while they're eating it, they're protecting themselves from becoming allergic. If we're the ones telling them to avoid it, we're causing allergy. And for all the physicians on the call, we all took an oath to do no harm. So that's a real problem. And now we can recognize this. We have the evidence to support this and we can help put a stop to this, especially from our primary care colleagues and also within ourselves, to be honest with you. Okay, in front of us. All right, how many of you have ever seen a patient who was concerned that they had um, toxic mold or that they were exposed to black mold? Uh, there's, there's a whole origin story here, but I believe it starts back to almost 30 years ago. Um, and this was the headline from the New York Times, infants lung bleeding traced to toxic mold. It has since taken on a whole life of its own since then. And what happened was, and this is Stachybotrys, we're all familiar with this, the black mold that grows when you have water damage on um, inside uh, homes and from drywall and leakage and stuff like that. So there was a cohort of infants living in Cleveland uh, in the 1990s that all developed pretty severe illness and they had associated pulmonary hemorrhage and hemosiderosis. And at the time, um, they were trying to figure out what was going on here. And they went into the homes and did this environmental assessment. And a lot of them lived in the inner city housing. So the living conditions were rather poor. And they found that almost all of them had detectable mold, stacky boaters growing in the dwellings where they were living. Uh, and so the assumption was made, they're breathing in black mold. This must be toxic to their lungs. Oh my gosh, these infants are bleeding from the inside out. What is going on here? Well, it turns out that that wasn't the case at all. This was a very rare uh, condition called Heiner syndrome, which can cause pulmonary hemosiderosis. This occurs in very young children and toddlers. Uh, the typical story is they've been started on cow's milk formula from birth, and they develop these chronic respiratory symptoms and can have infiltrates. You can diagnose it through high precipitating um, antibodies, not antibiotics, sorry, antibodies to cow's milk, and you take the milk out of their diet and they get better. Uh, so that's what's going on here, but the cat was already out of the bag. so. That's what led to all of us doing evaluations for toxic mold. Final thoughts as we wrap things up, and I'm happy to take any questions. This really does take a multidisciplinary approach. Sometimes folks end up with us because they start with their primary care uh, clinicians. Sometimes they start with GI to come to see us. Sometimes they're seeing dietitians. Sometimes they're seeing naturopaths and chiropractors and being told all these things. So it's up to us as allergists to really have a good understanding of what's going on from an immune standpoint, 
understanding the prevalence of these conditions, the likelihood, the differential diagnosis, and really working with a, a, with a larger team, especially when the diagnosis has been established, to help with nutritional support, to help with acute symptoms, chronic symptoms, and things like that. All right, so in summary, um, I think I just summarized right there, basically. We need to take a really detailed history and make sure we clarify the diagnosis before we recommend uh, a dietary elimination. And we need to help those that we really think have non-IgE food allergies better understand what the risk is, as well as management options as well. And with that, thank you very much.